Right, let's make a start then. So, it is uh, 3.35, we're almost running to time. Uh, it's 21.7 degrees. Um, there's no snow outside. Uh, those of you here last year remember this time last year it was snowing surprisingly heavily outside, so we seem to have avoided uh, that part of the fun. Um, so, now, it falls to me to do um, the famous, um, oh, hang on, uh, yes, the famous conference summary. Uh, so this is a surprisingly popular part of the program. I really, I mean, genuinely don't understand this bit, but um, this is where I kind of make an incoherent summary of roughly what's gone on over the last couple of days. Um, this is a presentation that I basically wrote during the workshop feedback, so obviously it's very high quality, uh, high quality stuff. So, here we go. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, let's go with this. Um, so, conference summary. So, this is me giving the conference summary. You don't need to know any of those things. This is you. This is the traditional photograph of conference attendees in their normal pose. Um, uh, me, I was supposed to really write the main part of this presentation last night, but after a fairly late night, I got back to my hotel room. So this is um, not me, but it could be me in my, in my bed in my hotel. This is, um, actually I found myself last night at dinner bragging about my children quite a lot. So I've decided a core theme of this presentation. So I'm going to illustrate it with mostly with, children, with photographs of my two sons. So you'll just have to live with that. Um, we have quite a lot of photographs of, of Charlie asleep. It's one of the things he d did best as a, as a young man. Um, so that's kind of me in the middle of the night when I was supposed to be writing this presentation, uh, not doing so. Um, so, anyway, uh, how can you stop this presentation? This is another traditional part of this presentation. Um, the only way to prevent this happening next year is to fill in your survey sheet and explain why it's such a total disaster. I actually have a cunning plan to delegate this task to uh, somebody else uh, next year, so that might be an interesting uh, idea as well. So, it's a very simple job doing this summary. What you have to do is you have to take a sort of level of uh, bizarre complexity, and this is my favorite bizarre complexity diagram, um, and you just have to make it something very simple and clear. Uh, so uh, that's pretty uh, straightforward. So what is the theme? I try and do a theme each year to kind of tie it together, and I put this diagram up because those of you in the sort of center portion of this diagram will be remembering previous year's themes. So um, a few years ago it was what does everybody want and I tried to describe what each of the participants in the sort of scholarly landscape wanted. Um, uh, the following year it was just ah, and I managed to do each slide began with an A except for the last two which began with G and H so I was quite pleased with that. Um, last year it was kind of things are being pulled in opposite directions it was about sort of um, tensions between different parts of the community and the supply chain. So uh, it is a bit of a question what the theme is this year. Um, I, I'm very tempted to just do, oh, it's just really complicated and, and the complication's bad and, and so on. Uh, but that might not, um, might not quite work. Uh, so um, it is true, this is a slide from 2016, which is it is a bit complicated. It used to be simple. And this is back from a, a, an Australian themed narrative from uh, uh, 2016, which is basically if you want to catch a kangaroo, you just hold out a sack and the kangaroo jumps into the sack. Uh, somebody else had given a presentation about uh, trying to get an octopus into a string bag, which is not as easy as getting a kangaroo into a sack, apparently. Um, but yeah, we've, every year we've done this, uh, yeah, just super complicated. So what I'm gonna try and do this year, back to that one, is talk about it, the goodness about the complication in a moment. Before I do that, I just wanna mention a couple of presentations and slides that were kind of dis disturbing to me psychologically, and I don't want to give my presenters a hard time because they'll, they'll be unhappy at that point, but what the heck. Um, so one of them was, uh, was the wonderful presentation um, by Uma about uh, publishing in India and scholarly research in India, but um, kind of red text on a, on a red background. Uh, again, my youngest son is colorblind, um, and he, probably the worst color combination, color combination you can possibly show a colorblind person is dark red text on a light red background. So this would be how he would feel when faced with a slide like that, um, which is heartbreaking, to be honest. Um, he's in his 20s now, so you'd be pleased to know he's not quite so sad now. Um, the other rather disturbing one was uh, two separate presenters, and I'm not going to name names, but you know who you are, used the COGS illustration. And I'm kind of okay with this bit, 
where they're going in opposite directions and the teeth are the same size and they're intermeshing. But actually what they showed us was this additional cog. And I'm not entirely happy with this as an analogy or an illustration or whatever the heck it is. And so I'm illustrating that with my oldest son looking extremely unhappy. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's how I feel about, about that slide as well. But anyway, so, uh, but otherwise everyone did very well, so yeah. So what are we going to do? What's the theme this year? The theme this year is, is uh, taken a bit from something that I think Justin said. When the ends justify the means, all you get is the means and you never reach the end, which sounded like a bad thing and it, and it still kind of sounds like a bad thing. But for the purposes of this summary, we're going to pretend it's not a bad thing. So we're going to try and embrace the idea that not just for the last 15 years, but for the next 15 years as well, we're going to be living in a world of, of bizarre means, not uh, nice orderly ends. So, hybrid is good. I'm not necessarily saying hybrid publications are good, but hybrid things, book journal hybrids are good, you know, those kinds of things. Turbulence is good, I'm going to claim. Disruption is good. You still need to start to embrace and enjoy this. Conflict is creativity. Uh, so, it's beginning to sound a bit Orwellian, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and run with it. But it is kind of confusing, and so I think uh, th there's a lot of responses to this confusion in the room and in the community. Some people are, are just sort of unreasonably enthusiastic about the whole thing and they're kind of just, oh, this is, you know, it's going to be great. Um, some of us do have questions. We're uncertain about what's going on. Uh, some of us are just, frankly, confused and bemused. Uh, some of us are a bit distracted and are thinking about other priorities. Uh, so that goes on too. Um, and uh, lastly, some of us just really lost interest in the whole process. So I think that's a the representation of all those schools of thought. Um, the enthusiast on the far left is, is Alex and the rest are his cousins. Um, so let's kind of talk about the mixed economy because I think a lot of the presentations were about um, mixtures and hybridization and, and, and doing interesting things. So I was interested in some of the early talk about, you know, authors are thinking about, sorry about the typo, they're thinking about their, their readership and that they're thinking not how am I going to publish, what am I going to publish, where am I going to publish it, but who wants to read this stuff? I've done this research, who wants to know about it? And if you go back to the very earliest days of scholarly publishing, basically you're Newton and you're going, I wonder if Leibniz would like to know about this, I'll write him a letter. And have I got the dates right for those guys? Anyway, that sort of thing. And, and so there is a thing about who wants to read this stuff. And so of course that does, as I say, compromise researcher to reader as a directional narrative rather a lot. So that's the new logo for the conference is reader to researcher is what it's going to be called next year. Um, and, but it's still a muddled mess and it's still difficult for, um, for academics to choose the journal that they want to publish in. And of course a funder mandate makes this much easier, makes your problem go away if people say you can only be funded if you publish the way we want you to publish. But there are some concerns about that and academic freedom, whether that's a broad interpretation or not. So we have to ask ourselves what powers do these uh, superhero, was it superhero academics? No, uh, superstar academics. Um, what powers do they have to influence how publication works from a point of view of, of them as the writer and, and of the reader? Um, but we can think about how we, um, we do that mixed economy and, and you know, that, that the, I'll go back, the old, this old fashioned cycle, which is so old fashioned now, I invented it like four years ago, is really a sort of complex series of interactions and, and dynamics going on. Uh, so that's kind of uh, confusing the heck out of me and I hope you as well. There are some barriers to this. There's a barriers to kind of making these hybrids and, and more complex solutions, embracing this complexity. One is, I think, political mandates. If you have a politically driven mandate that says it will be like this, it can be a barrier to creativity and embracing that complexity. Um, we talked a lot about systems and structure and workflows getting in the way. The ideas of, I'd like to have a book journal hybrid, but I can't because of ISBNs. You know, that's a kind of barrier to the things. There's some uncertainty about what the rules are. The reward systems are absolutely perverse. There's ethics, we talked a lot about that. And I'm going to say a bit more about each of these as we go through. So, political mandates, plan S or plan BS, as somebody called it uh, at a break when I was talking about. Um, I think there's a tension between trying to get co coherence and cooperation and collaboration and then trying to do that by mandating a set of rules. And if you mandate the rules and create drama in that way, I was talking to someone at, at the break, you, create, you get a tension by saying from tomorrow it's going to be like this, but there's quite hard to walk back from that if it turns out not to be a practical solution. So that is kind of troubling. 
System structure and work shows, uh, you know, particularly evident in that book journal thing, but I think there are other areas where there's kind of overlaps and complexities that, that are in those processes and in organizations. It's always struck me as kind of odd and interesting that a lot of publishers are basically organized as journal publishing and book publishing as completely separate divisions. And then five years later, they go reorganize and go the other way. But it, it is a kind of weird structural thing going on there. Reward system, I'm not going to talk about that, but it's, we talk about this a bit, and so maybe we need to, to put more time into it next year, about why, what is it that researchers get rewarded for doing, and are they being rewarded for doing the right things, and how can we change that process? But I'm going to say a bit more about ethics and Robin Hood's. Um, so the Sci-Hub debate, I think, was highly entertaining and interesting, and interesting to hear the kind of passionate uh, views on different sides there. So a great line, what sort of criminal... Can't be, you can't be a criminal because you're Robin Hood and you give away all your loot. So what sort of criminal gives us away all their loot? Here's an example of one. Um, so, uh, and I thought you'd like to see the moustache. Daniel, are you here? I can't see you in the audience. Daniel's run off. No, he's okay. Um, ah, uh, so there's the moustache because people want to see the moustache. Um, but you could also ask what sort of politician gives away all of somebody else's loot? And that's, to my mind, some of the political agenda that's, uh, that's going on. Um, you could also say what sort of business can reasonably be asked to give away all that brand activity. If you spent 100 years building up a reputation, um, there's value in that, and you deserve to be capitalizing on that value, it seems to me. Um, so the narrative, the Sahib narrative, there is a narrative. It's not my narrative. There's a narrative which is it's, it's a dodgy criminal enterprise, but it's worth it because it's going to destroy the evil empire, um, and then it'll probably just magically go away. And I think, um, you know, evil enterprise empires don't magically go away when they've won. Um, so that's kind of worrying as to what that, that goes. And I thought it was a very apt question about if we're kind of relaxed about security breaches now because they're good security breaches, at what point do we become unrelaxed because they're bad security breaches? So um, we were very happy to have some people talking about the rest of the world. Um, and I think we might want to do more of that because I think that was enlightening for everyone to see what was going on. And some of it was kind of weird. It was kind of sad that, that the lack of resources. Um, it was kind of weird that, that some of the ambitions of researchers in the global south, as we might call it, I, there isn't a good term for this, um, some of their ambitions are, are, are ambitions that uh, in, in other countries are starting to be swept away. You know, your ambition to publish in a big name subscription journal, uh, you know, here we say, well, that shouldn't be your ambition, that's a bad ambition. So that's kind of weird. Um, and I think that there used to be two worlds, and I, I want to commend you uh, to you, uh, the late uh, Hans Rosling's book, uh, Factfulness, if you haven't read it. There, who's read that? A uh, few people? Fantastic book. Really interesting about, and very dataful. Hans was a big uh, a statistician and quant kind of guy, and he's got really interesting data about uh, world economies and world health and so forth. And one of the things he talked about a lot, and it's mentioned in this book, is in the 60s, there really were two different worlds. There was the developed world and the undeveloped world, and it was very polarized. And you can see sort of in that chart, the top right is kind of um, modern Western countries, and bottom left is kind of everybody else. But actually, that's changed quite a lot. And if you look at the data, people are much more clumped together now. And actually, what's going on in Bangladesh is kind of both much more like what's going on in um, Basildon, um, but also still quite different. Um, and it's quite different, you know, if you look at, at what's going on in, say, nature, and uh, James is uh, on the front page, uh, so that, on the front cover, so that's pretty cool. And what's going on in Bangladesh, where a bunch of people are sitting around with flip chart paper and handcrafting a small local journal. And I think that, again, that diversity is not a bad thing. I think we should celebrate that to some extent, but obviously we need to think about how different those worlds are. Um, not following up roadmaps. Again, Hasib talked about that, about you know, things, you have a roadmap and a plan to develop and change, and then you don't follow through kind of ruthlessly and determinedly enough and, and make that happen. But also there's the other one, which is you've got an impractical initiative. You've created a plan, let's say, let's call it a plan, uh, and, it's, and it sounds very bold and a great roadmap, but it doesn't actually have practical implementability. And so you get this kind of collision between um, uh, uh, what's a, a bold statement and what's a realistic, achievable roadmap. Um, I'm not sure, what, is it a collision or is it, it's, you know, from last year, it's a, a pulling apart into, into different directions. So, um, 
that's kind of my, some of my thoughts on some of the things that are going on. So these are some of those, those barriers that I think we need to work on, we need to talk about more, uh, and we need to explore. I'm looking at my phone here to see whether the next speaker's uh, here or not. He might be on his way. Sorry? Right. Maybe. Okay, so good news. So our, our closing keynote speaker might be on his way. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that puts James in very good light. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, but also the exciting news is I basically, I just keep talking until he comes, um, and, that, and that could be quite interesting. I do, I have some backup slides. Um, in addition to those things, I just thought I should mention machine learning. We had a great panel, that was really interesting, so that's probably not the slide the panel would like me to put up on machine learning, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, we had some really interesting uh, data on research and replicability and teams from, uh, from Dr. Who, so that was great. Um, so we had some really good things. So what next? Usually at this point, I provide a complete unified solution. He's here. Hey. Complete unified solution to everything that, that we need to cure. But uh, this year, I'm not going to do that, which will be this point, of course. What I will say, and again, uh, it's a quote, I think, from, from Hasib's CV or something, is um, I think we're all research communication enthusiasts. And I'm going to declare that's going to be enough to carry us forward. I think we're going to all be enthusiastic. Here's an enthusiastic person. Um, and uh, we're going to keep that enthusiasm and keep meeting, keep talking and communicating um, so that we can overcome these barriers and move it forward. If that person's not quite enthusiastic enough, here's the same person slightly more enthusiastic. I just love that picture. He's so pleased with himself. Um, so uh, that is my solution to all of our problems is just enthusiasm. How about that? Ta-da! So that concludes my presentation. Um, while we uh, wait for our next speaker to just get ready, I have a backup presentation which Roger is now looking for called Names. Uh, and he's going to launch that. And we'll just do that until I see our next speaker arriving. And that will be perfect. See, be prepared. I was a Boy Scout and I have a backup. Here's the backup presentation. So when you're doing a lot of delegate lists and name badges and stuff like that, you sort of notice the names of the people. And so here are some interesting names. I thought you might enjoy these. So we have a kind of, this kind of rolling name thing. You've got Seferin James and James Perramarchant, and you've got Stefan Richard and Richard Mollet. I kind of enjoyed that. And I was super disappointed there's no one here called Patrick because that would, have been, that would have been so neat. So we have Neil Patrick, but we don't have Patrick anybody. So I don't, we're going to have to invite a Patrick next time. <laughs> uh, the people with the two most similar names, I've declared to be Mark Allen and Mike Allen. Uh, I'm quite pleased with that. Um, uh, shortest and long na longest names I know is a traditional uh, the speaker is about is a traditional thing we do. So the prize for the shortest name goes to Ali Fox. Ali, where are you? You here? Well done. Last year she missed out because she registered as Alison Fox. <laughs> See, it's it's clever stuff. Um, second equal goes to Ros and Lou. So so well done to them. Longest name always used to be Cecilia. Um, now, unfortunately, this year, we've allowed Deborah Lautenschlager to attend. And so that has created a difficulty for long and short names. So uh, you're going to have to do better next time. I don't know, put in a middle initial or something in. Um, Gene Shipman was very keen to be Gene P. Shipman. So if you add an extra initial or something, that might get you the prize next time. We've also got a lot of families here today. So there's the Anderson brothers, obviously. Um, we have a lot of Evanses. And we have quite a lot of whites as well. So we're, we're glad to have some families here. So that's the level of attention that I'm giving to the delegate uh, database that you, can, you can see going on there. Right, it now falls to me a great pleasure to introduce our closing keynote speaker.